this evening is just going to um, split the night up into a few topics. Um, I'm just going to look at a few kind of current topics, things that I've seen on my um, crop walking travels in the last uh, week or so, really. Um, we'll cover them first of all, because there might be some questions that uh, are covered there. Then we'll talk a bit about the importance of grass, which if you're an avid fan of Farming Connect webinars or Farming Connect meetings or plenty of other information on the internet, then you will know most of it anyway. Uh, we'll have a quick and simple look at the economic impact of weeds. Um, we'll have a look at um, cultural controls then, and then um, we'll get to the, uh, the chemical uh, control methods in, towards the end. Um, and discuss what we can do with them, really. Okay, so as long as everybody's happy, sitting comfortable, we'll get going. Okay, so now that you've got your piece of paper and your envelope or your biro or whatever you've got, if you've got any ideas what that is, write it down on a piece of paper um, and we'll go on. Okay then, so current issues. A question that I've been asked Constantly in South Wales, the last kind of week or two, is there any point spreading fertilizer? Okay. And the answer at the moment, unless things change, hopefully they will, is no, it's too dry at the moment. Okay. Um, we're measuring crop um, uptakes, and there's very, very little um, uptake of fertilizer because we haven't got enough water in the system. And if we look, now I've got a little red dot on the screen. The current situation is that there's a lot of volatilization of ammonia nitrate. Dew is not enough to take this fertilizer in. It'll make it squashy on the surface, but it needs water really to convert it into a nitrate for the plant to take up. So if you have got some expensive fertilizer standing in the barn, leave it there, especially if you're on lighter soils, okay? So we need a bit of rain before you put the fertilizer on. What happens once we've had some rain is you need to judge it really, possibly put half the normal rate on. If you have enough rain, put enough, but we've basically missed an application with the weather. So that's the advice. If it hasn't rained for two weeks, don't apply. The other thing that I've seen recently is that a lot of spring crops, be it be maize, uh, fodder beet, spring cereals, barley especially, is quite stressed, okay? Um, so you need to be quite gentle with what you apply in terms of chemicals. Um, the last few hundred acres of spring barley that I looked at uh, will not be having any growth regulator. They don't need it this year. Um, and then the other part of it as well is that if a fair bit of herbicides already being applied, they don't work particularly well in hot, dry, or cold conditions. And if we were ticking boxes, I think we've ticked every single box in that uh, sentence. And it's been hot, it's been dry, and it's been cold. So there we are. Now, this is a crop of maize that I um, looked at down in Bristol, right by the Seven um, Channel um, last week. And you can see there was pretty much some pretty horrible frost damage there, unfortunately. Um, and that plant is a uh, right tough. And the problem with frost damage is, if you look at the field, although I'm not a great photographer, um, is that it occurs in patches and fields and hollows. So you don't have uh, an easy decision, is the crop a right tough or not, okay? Um, so advice here really was we just kept an eye on it um, and see if it improves. Some of the plants along the hedgerow were right tops, okay. Now, maize will go purple in cold conditions. It's not too much to worry about at the moment. Oh, and here's your next little um, quiz. If you can try and identify, that's the weed there, okay, that's grass. Try and identify him be great or her maybe a little clue there for you okay right this is um a photo of a farm that i took last week 
I won't say where it is, but it isn't particularly high. He's not on top of a mountain or anything like that. Um, he is not in the Fantastic Farmers Club. Um, and the fair play to me was a bit of a, come and have a look, what's wrong? And the first thing I thought to myself was that, well, there's a lot of mule ewes in the field and they've only got single lambs on them, but that was something else, I suppose. Um, so when I'd look there, there's very, very, well, there's very, very little grass to start with, okay? That kind of um, pasture is barely going three or four tons of dry matter per hectare per year. So about a third of what you'd really want. There's an infestation of nettles. And you remember that these nettles are spreading by um, the rhizomes underneath the ground. So they'd be interconnected patches there. So you really have got a, a pretty unproductive piece of ground. Um, and I was listening to a talk by Leslie Stubbins last week where she was saying, you know, these lambs should be growing at about three, 300, 400 grams a day off the ewes to hit the target. They're not going to be doing that, are they? And also, um, they're most probably going to be giving the ewes a hard time as well. So that's most probably something we could look at to try and improve. I've got a bit of a plan going on forward with the farmer there really to improve that. But we'll go into those kind of things in a minute. And this is a, a real nice slide of the AHDB um, put together um, quite a few years ago now, really, but it's real simple and it's visual. This is the sward height here, so high, how high the grass needs to be. This is for a mule ewe with twins, okay? That's the level of grass that she needs so that you don't have to feed her anything else. Um, so five centimeters of grass, six centimeters is even better. Um, and you can see if she hasn't got that much grass in front of her, um, you're going to have to feed a qu three quarters of a kilo of concentrate, which is going to cost you 20p a day. And you're going to need to fill in this extra gap here with um, some additional forage, hay or whatever, or fodder beets, whatever is going to be in this situation. Um, I get off, quite often get called out to situations like this, or you know, something's not right, or the cake's not good enough, or whatever, and you go there, and basically the sheep are half starved, possibly because of um, you know poor conditions or whatever. But if you are in that condition, the one thing that you can do is feed both concentrates and hay to fill in the gap, isn't it? Right. And then this is a, a typical demand curve for use at grass. And you can see the real interesting part of this now is that we should be at peak grass growth. I'm sorry, I'm not talking for the whole of Wales because I think there has been some rain up in, in North Wales, but certainly in, in South Wales or Southeast Wales, um, we've been extremely dry and we're in a situation where we haven't really got enough um, grass to meet the demand okay so you know there are a few options here for farmers like myself really one of which is to sell lambs early um and if you're gonna get well what were they yesterday 92 quid for lambs at 30 30 plus kilos it might be just as well to sell them now rather than waiting six weeks when you haven't got any grass at all and you might get 80 quid for 42 kilos, so I don't know. So, you know, there's options there. Wean early, wean lambs at 10 weeks old and um, have the ewes up tighter. Um, and they will benefit from it. And if you look back at the, you know, the, the um, slide where there was a lot of mule ewes with, with singles, um, that's most probably a reflection of poor, poor um, condition at weaning last year. And that's why they've only produced singles this year. Okay, um, so that's a graph of, you know, balance of supply and demand, really. And then something that we're involved with um, across Wales and the West, the country, really, is that um, AHDB and HCC also do these schemes as well, where they do a grass watch sample, okay? Um, and basically, it's, you know, there'll be a group of about, I think there's 45 farmers in Wales that do this for us, um, and they collect a grass sample every week put it in the post, and then they average up the samples, they send to a lab, they average up the samples and we get the results back. Now, I always treat 
the figures with a little bit of caution, okay, because you've got to think about the psychology of the man or the, the person who does this and that. Um, if they're interested enough to stick something in the post and take a sample every week, they're most probably pretty keen on grass, okay? So you might not be quite in the same situation as people here. Um, so you can see there, dry mats are 20%, crude protein is always around as 25, 22 to 30%, excellent ME, 12.1. So, you know, you have got really, really good feed. And if you're in a uh, cattle grazing situation with dairy cows, there's 13 litres of milk off that. To, uh, and this was last week's figures. This will decline a bit because we're short of, of rain at the moment. So remember these grass samples, they are from keen farmers. And then if you translate that really then to, you know, um, if you're growing cattle, um, if you've got 100 um, kilo cattle out of grass, they'll still need, if you want to get a reasonable target on them, they'll still need about a kilo of um, of cake to keep them going. When they get up to slightly to heavier weights, 300 to 400, which would be more normal for that cattle turned out, um, then you know no cake required. But this is in a in a situation where there's no restriction on grass and there's plenty of good quality grass in front of them. And then um, most probably something that you've all come across really is you know pasture measuring. It doesn't have to be with a plate meter. Um, you know, you can use your welly, you can use a sword stick, they're freely available really, or a ruler. And, you know, once you get your eye in, you know, stock out at about four to five centimetres, which might be a bit of a challenge this year. Um, and sheep in at about six to eight, and then cattle in at eight to 12, then there shouldn't be any restriction really to them. And then if you're going over the 3,000 kilograms, 12 centimetres, it's time to shut the fields up for silage. And I think really, you know, it's within everybody's ability to measure grass. I sometimes wonder sometimes whether it's within everybody's ability to grow good grass. And then this was an experiment that was carried out in Scotland. Um, and what they did, did here quite simply really was they divided fields up, okay? And, you know, if you look at the, this is quite easy to do at home, I think that, you know, we all, if you start talking about paddock systems, we think of reels and reels, electric fences and complicated systems. Like, well, you actually looked at it, you know, most fields aren't particularly big in Wales. Um, and, you know, simple divisions around existing water troughs can cost very, very little and can bring massive benefits, really. Um, if you look at that, like a 92% increase. Um, and generally, the infrastructure cost is around about £30 an acre. So if somebody's offering you a 92% increase for £32, £30 an acre, it's certainly worth considering. And if you look at this in, in terms of you know, dry matter yield, a tonne, tonne and a bit of dry matter yield, you know, dry matter yield is equivalent to a tonne of barley with a bit more protein. Barley is about £139 a tonne today. So you can see that. There's, there's a fair old return on investment there, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Now, if we go into the... Um, part of it now about weeds. Um, a little bit of knowledge about the life cycle of weeds does help with the control, if you know if they're annuals or perennial weeds, um, and being able to identify some weeds. It's not easy, guys, right, to identify weeds. Um, quite often get blurry photos of weeds on the phone and what's this do you think Brian? I say, well I can't really tell I can't really see it well enough and there are thousands of weeds in the UK there are some apps that you can get now for your phone but I haven't found them particularly useful either okay so uh, one thing I do find useful is that you know the time of year you tend to get weeds come in certain weeds come in at certain times of year and if you know them you've got a good guess then um, best defense really against weed ingression or weeds appearing is to stop them getting there in the first place i know this sounds simple but you know having really well managed dense grassland going in non um, panned ground okay um can often be the way quite often see um seed mixtures sold that are supposed to be uh, medium to long term 
with very, very poor ground cover species in there, like Italians and Westerworlds. And you're, that's an open invitation, really, for other weeds to ingress into that, OK? And then some aspects of it are particularly difficult, especially with the, the winter that we had last year. Um, you know, poaching is always a, a matter for ingress of weeds, as is, you know, things like mole tumps, where you always find, um, you know, scotch or ball thistles where the moles have been. Um, and, you know, because it does provide ideal um, conditions for seeds to germinate. Um, topping on mowing, I'm not a massive fan really. Um, it can be useful with some of the grass species to get them out of the way. Um, but some of it is just um, expensive pruning, which makes things, um, makes things worse really. Um, and the other factor really to um, look at is make sure that your pH is, is maintained at a high level or a, you know, at a reasonable level for grassland. It's difficult really. Um, a lot of the soil sampling that we do quite often come back with poor pHs, possibly is the reason why they've tested the ground in the first place, but you know, maintaining pHs at a good level is, uh, is important. Right, and then uh, one of the things we do say about is compaction. Okay, um, you know, we had one, <laughs> difficult to remember now possibly, but we had the wettest winter on record really. Um, now, many of you will have seen some of these machines on farms, their pasture slitters or subsoilers, you know, three to eight thousand pound investment. You might do a few days work a year on a farm, possibly you can rent them. Something that you might not see much of really is one of these things which is a compaction meter, okay? They cost about 300 quid, uh, which is, you know, cheap compared with three or 4,000. It doesn't burn any diesel. And most kind of uh, decent agronomists or supply companies, somebody in the firm will have one of these um, and you can do your own compaction testing. And it's quite often the case that you don't have compaction. If you don't have one of them, most people have got a spade. Um, less people know how to use them these days, but you know, you can have a quick dig and you'll, you'll find out a lot. Some people have made a career out of telling people how to use spades in fields. Okay, so we're on to weeds. And when it comes to weeds, I think, you know, the dockweed is the super weed, right? This thing is very, very capable of causing us a lot of hassle. Up to about 60,000 seeds per year, okay? Um, the seeds for broadleaf docks can stay viable for up to about 25 to 30 years. Uh, seeds for curl leaf docks up to about 70. Um, they need light to germinate and they need the soil temperature to germinate. They can also um, produce um, growing shoots from the top of the root system there, which you can see. So um, they're pretty difficult to get rid of. And once you've got a root system like this, uh, it takes a bit of killing, okay? And this is one of the things that you don't want to be too involved with recycling, okay? Um, the weeds, seed, weed seeds will survive ruminant digestion, so they pass through most ruminants. Um, they'll survive in slurry, they'll still survive in manure unless you compost it properly to very, very high, well, to high temperatures, uh, and they survive in hay and they survive in silage. And something that you quite often see as well is that there is a fantastic crop of docks on the side of earth banks, slurry lagoons and stuff like that, which is just perpetuating the cycle. All right. And they're also, when they pass through the ruminant, they are dropped into an instant lump of fertilizer, which will get them going again. If you're still awake, uh, you can write down what this plant here is. Okay. And then if we look a little bit on the um, sort of an economic assessment of when do we spray or not, and it's pretty simple really that, um, you know, when you've got about 10% investation in the field of whichever weed there is, whether it's nettles, docks, thistles, um, you need to do something about it. If it's up to 20%, it's costing you money, okay? If 1% really, you know, it's too low, ideal for spot spraying then, 
um, up to about 10% spot spray over then, you need to do broad acre sprays, okay? And then it's very, very easy to measure. You know, you can do, you can do it on a, if you do it on a five by seven meter square, um, if, you, if you want to, you can count the number of docks in there. You know, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, so that's 20% 20 weed cover. That's 20% loss in grass. If you're producing 10 tons of dry matter per hectare, that's two tons of dry matter, that's two tons of barley, okay? If you want to do this at home, stand two meters apart, which you have to do now with COVID uh, rules, and count the number of docks between you. Right, so we've got an infestation of weeds. What do you do next? Well, it's then on to chemical control if you can't do anything else. If everything else has failed, reach for the can, okay? And this shows how old I am, really, I suppose. <laughs> um, it was beer that was advertised in the early 70s and 80s. <clears throat> okay. So once you've reached for the can, the first thing you need to do, right, is to make sure that you don't break any rules and regulations. Um, if you look on the um, DEFRA websites, right, although the UK has left the UA, uh, European Union, your health and safety responsibilities haven't changed in the transmission period. And then there's a fair bit of legislation um, regarding the use of agrochemicals, and we need to be careful that we adhere to the legislation for your own protection and also for the protection of uh, the general public and yourself. Okay, so um, the really important part is that you know you can walk into most agricultural merchants. And if you're a professional farmer, you can buy the chemicals, okay? But it is your legal obligation to ensure that the person applying that um, chemical is certified, okay? And there's legislation on the DEFRA website that you can look at. But, you know, quick things to remember is that um, very, very few pro products are approved for knapsacks, okay? The main sellers really is a product called Thrust and Graze on 90. Some of the Roundups, the glyphosate's are uh, registered with knapsack spraying. And although there's more of these weed wipers um, in the country now, um, the only there are only certain brands of glyphosate that can be used in a weed wiper as well. Nothing else is licensed for use in a weed wiper, so you shouldn't put your own concoction in there, okay? And then something else I always say to uh, people is that there's a lot of information on the label of the chemical can. Uh, make sure you read it, okay? Uh, some of it is statutory, some of it is, um, you know, information for, for your own uh, good, um, and it's worth, worth reading. What you will find with it is that they don't list all the weeds that might be affected by the um, chemical on there. They only list the ones that uh, they, they've conducted the experiments on, okay? And there's also parts on there that will tell you, um, you know, when you can apply and when you can't apply. And just a few common sense things as well, um, you know, don't cause any pollution. So, you know, it's, it's pretty basic here really, but certificates, avoid water, you know, Welsh water spend a lot of money getting chemicals out of um, out of water, so don't put any in there. Um, don't wash your sprayer where the um, runoff will go into the ditches. Um, okay, and don't exceed the maximum dose, and don't do it in the rain because there's very, very, very few products that are actually rain fast, so you'll be wasting your your time and your money. So don't cause any pollution. It's pretty simple. Right, and then if you look at, well, how do the chemicals work? It's pretty simple, really. If you want to kill a plant, you must give it a lethal dose of the chemical into the root. That's the only way that you'll kill it, okay? That's for a perennial plant. You've got to get enough poison into the root, okay? To do that, you need enough area on top to take the lethal dose up, and 
also the plant must be actively growing okay so translocate or to move that poison down into the root now sounds really simple the problem comes really is that sometimes there's not enough leaf area especially when we're talking about docks or sometimes those leaves aren't particularly active or they're at different stages and that's you know the fundamental reason why we have kind of sometimes disappointing results with the use of um, agrochemicals okay and i put this photo in really um this was earlier on in the season and the, these docks are absolutely spot on for spraying if you can have them all like that that's great okay and the next one um there's a field that was <clears throat> last week sprayed a bit late sorry the picture's not brilliant i'm not great with the camera um sprayed a bit late a few flowering heads there but you know that's still going to uh, a it's quite satisfying that it's been done and they're dead b you know you are still going to avoid a lot of seed heads going into your next year's rotation so although not ideal and there's a there's a good dock infestation there um you you are going to make a difference let's see we've got, oh, we've got a bit of movement there it's even better right and then if we look at the um chemistry that's available for um spraying weeds out you've got um, three basic groups really the phenoxies okay and these are the ones that with most well your, your fathers would be familiar with as well um you know your mcpas your two four d's merkel props dichloropops um they tend to be the products like head headland saxon uh polo um well, various others really um agritox okay um tend to give you quite satisfying to use and they give you a good rapid top kill so the leaves twist up and die um the conditions need to be really good for them to translocate into the roots so you do tend to have to do a bit more with them they're quite cheap or cheaper per liter and then the others are the pyridine carbolic silic acids and they tend to be the old dow products uh clopidolytra clopidin fluoroxypa um they are better at translocation as long as you get the conditions right they tend to be a bit more expensive per liter and you know very very familiar names here like the gray zones the pastors box stars star rains um Tislex is in that group as well okay um and then there is another group um although um Fewer members of this group now, really, really the sulfonylureas, um, amidosulfuron, which is quite ultra, which is about the only um, clover safe chemical we've got left, really. And then there is another product that is marketed as being uh, clover safe pinnacle, but uh, had some interesting results with it, really. Um, it can affect the grass growth, it needs very, very good conditions to work. It tends to be very slow acting and it tends to be a little bit of an agronomist nightmare um, because we have a lot of complaints with it. Okay, so I steer clear of that one. Squire Ultra is okay. Um, right, and then on the horizon 2022, which will soon be with us, I suppose, um, Cortiva are promising a, a new clover friendly herbicide. Um, so that'll be very, very interesting guarantee you one thing it won't be cheap but um you know it could be very 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 useful for us so um grass and chemistry is pretty simple get the right product right timing and the right application not always easy to achieve and there again you know the product's right it's not the living daylights out of the docks but most probably too late okay and now I'm going to show you just a few quick slides. This is an experiment we carried out with um, ourselves um, a few years ago now, but it's really interesting. Um, I don't know what this little green uh, blue alien is here. It's a spray suit, really. But um, this past year, okay, was this is a picture taken in uh, 2015. Re, it was a reseed done in 2010, right? And the difference here is that. That patch there, the square patch there, 
was sprayed almost immediately after um, the release it came up. Once there was three leaves on the grass, it was, it was sprayed, okay? And you can see five years on, that is still clean compared with the others, which are, well, you're back to almost a reseed situation there. Lots of spare ground, um, not particularly productive. Um, and then if we look, this is an aerial photo um, taken in 2014. And you can see that the one that was applied in 2010 has got very, very, very few docks left in it. Okay, and you can see that the one, you know, they're untreated, infested with docks, high dose of dock star, three liters a hectare there in 2012, still got a few docks, and then four from T applied 2012, you know, which is a great um, chemical, really, a great product, um, still got a fair few docks. So the trick really is to spray it real early uh, in the season. And this is backed up really by um, quite a lot of research work done in in Ireland um, by the Irish um, Agricultural Board. And you can see that if you spray seedlings in pasture, your dock infestation stays low. If you don't do anything, it catches up to where you've been. You know, remember now, reseeds are expensive, 200, 250 pounds an acre generally. So, you know, if you can keep them going for a longer time by a little bit of spray at this stage, all the better. Right. Now, if you're an independently minded chap person, um, you know, there are apps available now for your smartphone. Some, you know, somebody was telling me the day before that 90% of farmers have got smartphones now. Um, so you can have apps like this. It's got things like, you know, weed identification on it. I don't find it particularly um, e easy to use, really, but um, it's quite useful um, otherwise, and it gives, does give you some decision trees, but identifying weeds off it, not easy. And then, you know, the old manufacturer's kind of labels of um, or product data sheets telling you what is what is, is reasonably useful. Problem with them is that as sprays are taken off the market, this is one from two years ago, when I can see there's three or four sprays there that have been taken off the market. Okay, so um, a little bit kind of go out of date quick, a lot of sprays disappearing. Right, so I'm going through it as a fair rate of knots now, guys, but um, just a little few guides on product selection as. Um, Tristan said at the start, you know, the, you can look at these again, really, but, you know, if you've got a new lay, sorry, we've got a dog there, uh, with clover, okay, your only option at the moment is Squire Ultra with spruce, okay? Um, if you've got no clover in it, you've got a few other options available. Um, dingo, one litre of hectare is good for thistles and mayweed. Chickweed tends to be a big problem in uh, new lays, so you can treat it with envy there. And then fat hen red shank, especially in the spring new lays, um, you can use pasture mash and hurler. Um, cost wise, the Squire Ultra mix will cost you about 20 quid an acre. Uh, the Dingo mix, about 12. The envy is about 12. And then the um, pasture master is about 12 pounds an acre as well. Uh, I'm doing that in old money, I'm sorry about that. Um, and then established grasslands, if you've got docks there again, with clover, you go to go down the square ultra and spruce root. Now just to say here as well, that spruce 24DB um, is a chemical that we've had for about 40 years and it looks as if it's gonna go off the market now. Uh, well, it is going off the market last use is going to be October and November this year. So we're going to lose that. So we'll be totally reliant on Squire Ultra there. Um, okay. And that works out, you know, £24 an acre. If there's no clover in the mix, Thrust and Hurler does an excellent job. Um, about £19 an acre. Dockstar Pro, I don't advise anymore doing the split dose with Dockstar Pro. There's disappointing results, really. So stick to the full dose, £22 an acre. And then you can use dingo as well. That works out about 24. If you've got thistles, 
it is difficult, okay, especially on sheep farms, you don't want thistles really. If you go with clover, there's nothing really effective that's not going to affect your clover. Um, so, you know, you can, if you're willing to sacrifice some clover, MCPA or MCPA 2.DB mix, Polo or Pasture Master is an option, but you will sacrifice some clover. If you're not worried about your clover, uh, Thistlex does an excellent job. We will also knock your nettles about, or MCPA Agritox, you know, relatively cheap, good top fill at about £7 an acre. Okay, Thistlex is about 12 and then um, old grassland, if you've got ragworts and then no clover, thrust is very good, forefront does a very good job on, on ragworts as well. Uh, tend to be a little bit on the dearer side. Uh, the thrust will cost you sort of 25, 30, no, 25 pound an acre uh, forefront to be up there as well. And then um, no clover, pasture master is easy enough there as well. Okay. And then rushes. Um, quite suitable for weed wiping is one of the places that I, I don't mind weed wiping really um, uh, because they do stick up above the grass um, and it also reduces the risk of getting MCPA in water courses so you know it can be weed wiped if not you can put pasture mass around them that's a MCPA 24D mix does a good job 24 pound a hectare 10 pound an acre right okay and then this is the next one for our little quiz as we're going through. Can you identify that? Now, that might catch a few people out. Right, so think carefully. And then um, in severe um, dock infestation places with um, where it's only grazing, okay, forefront tea, it's still available. It's a stewardship, stewardship scheme with it where you've got to sign on on the app with Cortiva and then the registered basis um, person like myself gives you permission then to have the chemical. Does do a very, very effective job, takes out a lot of other weeds as well as docks. Um, it does have a residual effect in the soil. Um, so that's why it's only for grazing ground. Not cheap, but in a way it's cost effective because um, it does give you longer lasting um, treatment. And then these are the standards then, you know, your MCPAs, your Docstars, Pastor, which is in a funny two-pack now where it used to be in one can, uh, good spectrum of weeds. Uh, okay, so. And then the other thing that we are doing a lot of research on at the moment is um, putting some fertilizer or trace elements in, in with your um, herbicide. Um, sorry about the product placement there, folks. Okay, um, I've been quite good at not placing it except for the can of beer fosters. But um, here we are. Um, we're looking at this. We're interested in this really, in that um, you know, being able to apply fertilizer as well as a herbicide is obviously a cost benefit to you. And we're also looking at whether it makes the um, herbicide more effective. Especially interested in things like squirrels, which are a bit slow to get into the plant, and whether it increases the effect of the no. So, you know, there could be some news there, really. Um, but, you know, adding a can of something like this costs you about seven or eight quid an acre, and you're putting a fair dose of nitrogen on as well. And this is the last one in our quiz, which is you can identify that, hopefully. Okay, right. That's the end of the show, really. If we just give you the answers for the quiz now, uh, the first one was annual meadowgrass, very, very um, invasive weed of, of grassland, very highly productive, produ reproduces in between six to eight weeks. Um, we used to have chemicals that could take it out, but not anymore. The next one, chickweed, particularly important weed for reseeds, uh, will suppress any tiller in the grasses. That needs to be taken out with reseeds, okay? Um, and it's quite easily done. And the chemical that takes that out will also take your seedling docks out. So, you know, it's a worthwhile investment. It doesn't cost, it costs a lot to do that. And your lay will be better for taking that out. The next one was a little bit of a trick question, but I put it in de deliberately. Chicory, okay? Quite extensively used now in lays, you know, I'm sure you've heard some of the Farming Connect data on it. 
good for um, lamb grazing, lamb finishing, very, very deep rooted. Okay. Uh, one of the, th it's a bit of an agronomist's nightmare, really, in that anything that's good at killing weeds is good at killing chicory. And just on that point as well is that if you're using slightly more exotic mixes of grasses, things with like veg fescues and things like that, try and avoid the um, kind of the pyridines, the chlorpyrrolids and the phylloxypers, the dock stars and those things, because some of those chemicals do kill the fescue. So you need to bear that in mind, okay? I've been caught out, I caught out with it about 10 years ago. The last, long from the last was cooch. Um, and if you've got an infestation of cooch, best thing you can do is get the glycophate can out and get rid of it, okay? And the last one really was, um, you know, what we're all trying to achieve is a good layer of perennial ryegrass. Distinctive red markings on the base. Okay, the only other grass that's got that, and it's only got stripes, is Yorkshire fog, okay, which looks as well as wearing pyjamas. So, right, I've rushed through that, folks, apologies, but um, a lot to cover in a very, very short period of time. And that is my um, tips for success. Have a quick look at those whilst Tristan comes back into the um, scene, hopefully with the questions for what I've got answers for, anyway. Thank you very much, folks, for listening. Thank you very much, Bryn. Um, I'm Gavlina at the Iwerion and Sam Wibodaeth. Thank you for a very informative presentation, um, full of full of useful advice and tips. Um, yet I'm going to go to the question now. I'm going to go now. We've had nine questions so far. We'll um, try to get through them all. I can't promise anything um, since time is uh, running out, but um, I'll make a start now without any further delay. Uh, question Kuntadani Digal, the first question, Bryn. Um, we have a red clover lay now in its third year, but with an increasing proportion of docks. Should we spray out docks and probably the clover too and attempt to oversee the clover or go for a reseed? If so, when we want to avoid ploughing, it seems to throw up far too many new docks. If you can answer first, to that. Yeah, first question, I suppose, is which variety of red clover in it? If it's um, you know a five-year variety like Abaclaris or something, you most probably got another couple of years um, on on the red clover. So it's worth trying to do something with spruce and squire whilst we've still got those chemicals, um, and try stitching in some some new seed afterwards would be my um, my advice. You will need to wait, um, I think it's a month after applying Squire and, and Spruce to that. Okay. Good morning. Hope that answers your question. Uh, Nessa, um, the next question How do we get rid or reduce Centura, Micra, or Hardheads? If not, get rid of it, at least reduce it. Do we cut early? Cut early or rotationally graze, really. Yeah. So the, the, the other the other way really is a is a reseed job, but they can be um, can be troublesome. And if you're starting to get real problems with them, then it can be a reseed. But you know, cultural methods first, see if they work, and then if not, it's a reseed. And try try and avoid you know you know my kind of slightly glib slide about recycling of weed seeds this is what we're going to try and avoid really isn't it like you you know you you get these things that will um go to seed early you recycle the seeds and all of a sudden you've got a you've got a massive problem on the farm we've seen it in arable farming where you know we've recycled black grass seeds for years and years and now you know a lot of east anglia is very very expensive to go cereals in because because we've avoided the cultural meat methods we have got opportunities on mixed farms, grazing, crop rotation, um, to reduce those um, problems. There's no herbicides, okay, that will take those grasses out of um, grassland. Thank you very much. This, that question sort of links into the next one, which uh, asks, does rotational grazing help to decrease weeds by grazing them out? Certainly on the grass side of it, yeah. If you prevent them from uh, going going to head, um, 
yeah, high stocking densities on things like docks um, do help. Uh, they will graze hard um, up to about, oh, it's about 10 centimetres on docks. You know, quite a few of the um, South Wales hill farmers here tell me, oh, you don't have docks, we've got, well, we got Nelson sheep, like, you know, so, um, yeah, yeah, they, you know, hard grazing will help, yeah. Um, a question which uh, doesn't relate to weed control specifically, but anyway, forecast for overnight, Thursday is heavy rain for a short time and a few hours of drizzle. Would the dressing of fur to be a good idea? Short answer, yes, get on with it. Yeah, short and sweet. Yeah. Um, this next question from... Who, uh, what rate of application of Grayson Pro do you need to apply to a Ritchie weed wiper? The industry is quite woolly on weed wiper application rates. I don't know if you've got the answer to hand there. And that it's yeah, I have, yeah. Uh, and the only answer I can give is that glycivate, some brands of glycivate are the only approved chemicals for use in weed wipers. Okay. Fair yeah. Next question. I've just closed silage fields off and there's docks present. Due to the dry weather, I'm not keen to spray. Will it knock the grass will it knock the grass back and should I wait for some rain? If so, how long should I then leave before cutting silage? Oh, yeah, D difficult. It depends which chemical you use, really. Um, I tend to go towards with um with silages, I tend to go towards um the pyridine types okay so you know your dock stars and things like that because they tend they are softer on the crop now you've got to look at you know it depends if the uh, question is coming from north wales where possibly they've had a little bit more rain than we have down here um not much not, not much no um you know so it, is the dock actively growing um you know, questionable there, but I would I would tend to steer towards Dockstar, preferably giving it 14 to 21 days post-spraying uh, post before you harvest, really. Uh, but it's difficult in the weather conditions we're having now. I know some, some people are rushing to take silages or crops because they're worried about the crop disappearing in front of them. So, yeah, if you can, do it, yeah. And we used to, used to use a... a a uh, chemical called Prompt, um, which would do a very, very good job of taking, you know, docks have appeared in um, in grassland out of silage crops. Um, but, you know, that's not a pool for grassland anymore, really. So, yeah, go towards the dock star routes, really. Okay. Um, how good are the clover safe chemicals on docks it seems like a balancing act between keeping the clover and killing the docks yeah quite quite true really and we're we going to lose um one of the main kind of um main agents really which is spruce 24 db um you know which helps with the um effectiveness of squire um and effectiveness of pinnacle i avoid pinnacle as i said in my talk really because um I've had you know disappointing results. Squire can work okay if the conditions are right. It doesn't like dry, cold, um, or hot weather. So um, it, it is a it is a balance. You know, like I'm looking forward really to 2022 if it makes it to the market. This new uh, product from uh, Corteva, uh, which is based on a, we know all the chemistry is in there. It's based on a arable ground. Um, chemical um so you know that could be a, a help but you know it is difficult with with docks and clover um yeah and all you can do really is, is to try with with square ultra square ultra plus spruce sometimes gives you good results yeah yeah um, but, you know, there's, still, there's still a few questions to get through so um yeah. hopefully we'll get to the end but uh, i can promise um, question is, uh, any tips on scotch thistles? Um, well, they tend to be open ground, really, and they're, they're quite easy to take out, really. Thistle X, you know, does a good job on them. Um, if you've got clover in the situation, 
it's a bit more tricky then, but you're going to have to sacrifice some clover and is the, you know, Polo, MCPA kind of products will will sort them out, really. They're, they're not that difficult. You don't, you know, I, I, one of my pet hates really is thistles on sheep farms. I think they cause off, they cause hassle, um, and I think it's worthwhile, you know, getting them out of the way. And, you know, thistle X will give you good results for th you know, sort of three or four years at very, well, relatively low cost, isn't it? Like, so 10, 12 pounds an acre tops, really. So, um, you know, it does a good job. If you're worried about the clover, you'll have to go MCPA, really. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's like all of these, really, it's a little bit of a cultural thing, open soils, you know, and who didn't poach the grassland last year, really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, what would you recommend to treat uh, less uh, hawkweed in grass? Thrust. Three and a half litres. Um, next question. How about bracken ingressing from the field edges? What's the best course of action? Right, guess? a couple of courses of action there. Uh, weed wiper glyphosate is quite effective. Um, and I, you know, one of the I'm showing that slides, uh, Tristan of the um, of the frost that caught the maize. I've seen quite a bit of bracken ingress that had been caught by frost as well this this time as well. Uh, it doesn't like bruising, you know. So you know, I know some people who have, you know, if you don't like chemicals, have have bruised it and got it out of the way. Um, and then of course you you know you've still got an option with um, as you locks. Yeah, um, one of the Florazulam's chemicals can be used from June until, or um, be careful you now, September, I think, still available. Um, so spray that, that's 11 litres per hectare, and it's only licensed now for bracken spraying. So options, summarise, glycophate in a weed wiper, um, or... Um, Ban a boom spraying with Azulox in in a boom spray. Yeah, right. You know, it's quite easily done, really. Yeah. Is June to September the best time to treat? Uh, well, that's the only time the chemicals available. There's okay. a there's a I think there's a hundred and twenty day um, license period for for that. So I'll give you an example. It comes into our shops in June, I think, uh, or June or July anyway, and then we have to take it off the shelves in September whenever the period is over. Right, so there's a, a, a limited approval for, for that chemical. Okay, thank you, Brent. Um, a few questions on chickweed. Um, mm. uh, I've been using plantain and chicory in reed seeds and have a chickweed infestation. What is the best solution? And the next one, again, relating to chickweed, which product would you recommend to control chickweed in right. uh, autumn reed, last autumn reed seeds? Yeah. If you've got plantain and um, chicory, there aren't any chemicals that will not take those those things out. Okay, so you'll have to sacrifice your um, plantain or chicory, and then um, you know the chickweed is relatively easy to take out. Any fluoroxapia products, tomahawk, hurler, starine, there's a very very good job on it. Um, Envy. Um, and Dingo, the two new um, Cortiva products, do a good job on it. Re it's relatively easy to take out, really. Um, three quarters of a litre of any of those um, fluoroxapires um, approved for use in the autumn. They'll take seedling docks and quite a few other weeds out as well. So, um, and they'll kill your clover as well. Um, but yeah, so that's the answer for a, a straight grass lay. Um, the answer for um, where you've got plantains and um, chicory and other things in there, um, you'll take take those out. Unfortunately, that's why I put the chicory into the like the quiz part of it because it, you know there's it, something that does cause problems really with lays. Um, although they you know they've got a lot of benefits as well. Oh, Brent, um, I don't think we'll be able to go through all the questions, but I've try to group them together um, to common common themes and rushes uh, come up yeah. twice so um, anything uh, well, does work well to clear rushes yeah two, op two options really isn't it um, 
and the one the welsh waters and i did mention didn't mention tristan really and i i should have done really in the talk was um quite often get guys phoning me up um how many gallons an acre of this uh stuff i got in the shed in the white can where where's the label then mr farmer well there's no label on it welsh water at the moment right have got a um a pesticide disposal scheme that's open until the 29th of may if you've got any uh, yellow or white cans in your spray store or whatever else you or the old freezer or whatever else i suggest that you uh give, give them to welsh water register on the scheme and get rid of them guys okay because uh, they'll only cause you headaches in the future um so the welsh water answer to control in rushes is uh weed wiping with glyphosate um is, is quite effective where you're doing it and um as long as you're not going to cause any um pollution to water courses the chemicals of choice really are mcpa or mcpa 24d mix so your agritoxes or your pasture master or your polos and uh, quite effective on rush really uh, you might have to do them a few years in a row um but you know i've got some photos but we won't do that now with time of you know people who've done them three or four times with um with polo and gone from you know 80 percent rushes down to 10 like so yeah keep at them and you know sometimes it's worthwhile topping them if they've gone a bit strong and um spraying the aftermath around one thing you will find is don't get your sprayer stuck because they tend to make the ground wet don't they? okay 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 um there's one or two questions yeah. left so hopefully we can go through them um you mentioned that uh, topping um topping thistles doesn't work um would using a flail uh, be better it's just a question yeah slightly like better yeah it just um you know i some of you know it's quite an expensive process topping isn't it you know you burn a fair bit of diesel i think a um and you'll have the same problem next year whereas if you use you know correctly use an agrochemical um you know you can avoid doing a bit of that really because you know topping them you're only just spreading them about really and like um if especially when you're dealing with scotch thistles uh who've got a two-year life cycle you don't get them in the first year because they're flat to the ground well, and you're, you're only taking off the kind of the aerial part of the plant so you know it might make you feel better um it might make the place look tidier take a few um harder the grasses out as well but um yeah it's not a particularly effective control is it yeah no. um this is coming in from an organic farmer um, apart from rotational grazing how can we control weeds in organic grasslands it's not easy um cultural methods really and you know something like you know plants are really thick you know that's what i where i've been successful with this is um quite bad dock infestations on one farm i can think of and what we've done there is under sown spring oats with quite a thick um lay with good ground cover scores one of the and that's been reasonably effective one of the things that i, I am seeing really is that you know some some people are selling like medium term lays with italian ryegrass and westerwolds in which have got poor ground cover scores so you know um take care to select um a lay that's got a good ground cover score because uh, you know the only method you can really is drowning out the weeds isn't it so um that's what i found effective other things not particularly effective guess watch that nothing runs to runs to see that runs to that i suppose yeah yeah um what's the best thing to do for well established brambles um well cut them back as suppose, and then um graze on 90 in an appsack is quite effective on brambles um and so is um tomahawk hurler starring reasonably effective on it as well so yeah but you know it's difficult to get good coverage on them you know, try and cut them back and then spray the regrowth would be my um preferred method really yeah 
Uh, question all out, last question. After spraying thistles and killing off, is it good practice to scratch in new grass seeds? Yeah, if you can, yes. Yeah, I know no harm putting new seeds in any at any time, really. Yeah, as long as there's enough moisture there. You are going to disturb the soil. There might be seeds there, but, you know, if you can out-compete the thistles, all the better, reason. And you use, use a... Um, Use a translocated um, spray like Thistle X or Pastor on them so you get a root kill and you will have to wait, I think it's 28 days before you scratch in the seeds. Okay, because there's a residual effect of the um, spray on the ground. That's the end of the Q&A session. Uh, thank you very much for all your questions, everyone. Um, and thank you again, Bryn, for answering them all.